Indeed. So we are in the Gospel of John, 10th session, and it happens that we'll be covering chapter 10 in this session. So uh, now, uh, you may recall from the last session that, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, beggar that was born blind was, you know, uh, 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 excommunicated, which is, uh, and so this is, this is really a continuation from the fl- last few verses of chapter 9. So this is also known as the famous Good Shepherd Discourse. And uh, uh, so this phrase is so well known. And, no, and many of us have heard the Good Shepherd Discourse so often. Uh, we run in the danger of taking it for granted. And so one of the things we might just do is stop and refocus and try to listen to it for, uh, afresh. To really listen to what Jesus is saying in this unusual passage. And also we need to understand the context here is the Pharisees were appointed to be the shepherds of Israel. So this is a double-edged sword that we're going to be dealing with here. And uh, uh, they were shepherds of Israel, yet they were described as strangers in verse 5, and they're called thieves and robbers in verse 8. And and maybe the most indictful of all of them, hirelings. Uh, in verses 12 and 13. I remember my dear friend uh, Walter Martin, who was very well, one of the most published uh, uh, Christian ministries all in his lifetime, but he always threatened the Christian publishing industry, which he knew well from all those years, that he would threaten to write a book about Christian publishing. And uh, uh, he never, for, to their relief, he never pulled it off, but he, was always, he always called it, the title was going to be The Hirelings. And so that, that, uh, that's uh, sort of the flavor we have here in this p- p- passage, too. Uh, the, the shepherd references are all through the Bible. It's amazing how that concept and that use is uh, pervasive throughout the, uh, the Scripture. And there, in your notes, you'll have some places you can follow up, and I encourage you to uh, dig through those notes. And uh, like in Ezekiel 34 and other places. In fact, you may want to read the whole chapter 34 of Ezekiel in, th- in that regard. Now, we speak of types, of course, examples, what have you. Uh, shepherd types actually start in, with Abel. He was the, he was the first. We, and, uh, and, of course, he was uh, slain by wicked hands. And uh, Jacob uh, t- took care of the flock. And uh, we find this the concept of a uh, shepherd all from the very, very beginning. And uh, jo- even the incredible career of Joseph, becoming prime minister of the world, started when he was feeding the flock. And uh, Moses, of course, watered, protected, and guided. And uh, David himself, not only was a shepherd, he jeopardized his life for the sheep. And so we, uh, we, we, this very menial uh, task is actually uh, edified by the incredible, uh, its actual incredible history as God uses it. And... Uh, It seemed appropriate when you make a list of these examples that the sixth should be the opposite. Because the only physical description of the Antichrist in the Bible, in my opinion, to my knowledge, is in uh, Zechariah 11, the last few verses. Physically described, the only only physical glimpse we get of this this destined person that will eventually uh, bring in the final curtain. But uh, so it's appropriately number six on the list, six being the number of man and so forth. And of course, that allows you to put seven as the, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And those three terms are you in, in uh, blazoned in three psalms. Before we're through, you'll understand that Psalm 22, 23, and 24 are known as the shepherd psalms. Each one very different than the others, and yet all of them, of course, uh, presenting us with our the chief shepherd and so on. Um, now, the sheepfold in some of these things is not heaven. When he says sheepfold, in some ways, let's realize he's talking about Judaism, because the, co- the immediate context that he's dealing with is localized as Judaism. So let's let's remember that. And uh, now the Messiah properly entered that sheepfold too. And uh, you know it's amazing. You know we just got back from a conference uh, uh, in Auckland where that was uh, featured. We had three sessions. The first session was all about the history of Israel. And the second session was all about, uh, the next day was about the, ch- the church. And we call both of them the prodigal ha- heirs. Because both of them, they have very different origins, different destinies. But, but each one of them has generally not succeeded in what they were called to do. 
Israel certainly didn't, and that's what Stephen so edifies when in his summary in the book of Acts that we study, Acts 7. It's one of the most interesting summaries of the whole Old Testament by Stephen to the Sanhedrin itself. And then as we look at the history of the church, we realize it's even to this day characterized by uh, all kinds of heresies and, and, and misunderstandings. And, and that's our challenge, of course, to sort through these things. And it's interesting that God always does salvage a remnant in each case. But getting back to Judaism here, the Messiah entered Judaism properly. He was born in Bethlehem. Uh, he was born under the law, we find from Galatians 4. He was circumcised the eighth day as the law prescribed. And, of course, he was even presented to God in the temple. Luke 2, you know, you know these stories. So let's just jump right in into chapter 10, recognizing that we're going right. The first 18 verses will deal, of course, with the, the good shepherd aspect of our Messiah. So it starts verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you... You know, that's a, with that phrase, let me comment on that briefly. When Jesus wanted to emphasize something, he'd say, I say unto you such and so. If he really wanted to emphasize it, he'd say, Verily, I say unto you such and so. If he wanted to put three underlines in there, he'd say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Or, Amen, Amen. Same equivalent, if you will. Okay. So he starts right off here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now let's not take that little idiom for granted. Um, the tabernacle was designed with one door. Noah's ark had one door. And who closed the door on Noah's ark? The Lord did. And uh, the illusion here with the tabernacle, same thing. Only someone that was entitled could enter through that door. Anyone that didn't wasn't entitled, was in effect a, a, a thief or a robber or what have you. And now the word sheep here is another. We take the sheep for granted. Now many of you here know more about sheep than I'll ever learn. I understand that. But let's focus a little bit on who are the sheep. His sheep, of course, the question you have to ask is, does acting like a sheep make you a sheep? Standing in a garage does not make you a car, right? Behaving like a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. And we need to understand uh, 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 that, obviously. What does the Scripture say about sheep? What do we know about sheep? They describe them as clean animals. Now, some of you may laugh at that because you know more about sheep than that their propensity to stay clean ain't one of them. But it's speaking Levitically. That is, it's, defi it's defined Levitically as, as a clean animal. They're ritually pr pure in Leviticus 11 and elsewhere. They are also harmless as doves, and indeed, that's, that, that's colorful. We also, uh, they're, they're helpless. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And that's certainly, it, we discover his referring to us as his sheep um, is rather descriptive. Because I understand that uh, uh, sheep are not very bright. And, uh, I'm, I, you know, so I, I think I are one, you know what I mean? Uh, we... we uh, uh, also understand that they're not very bright, but if there's a hole in the fence, they'll find it. And, uh, and that's, that, descri that also seems to describe us too. And uh, they're dependent, and they are prone to wander, and, uh, uh, but they are obviously useful. And uh, so, for what that's worth. But moving on here, he, Jesus continues, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice." That's very interesting. And this is probably one place I can share with you a belief I hold that I can't find in the Bible. When the rapture occurs, we're going to hear a shout, the voice of the archangel, and so forth, right? I personally believe what you will hear will be your name. And, and we will recognize his voice, obviously. So, uh, anyway, moving on here. Continuing types of shepherds. Uh, Porter, of course, here, uh, could he be considered the John the, Spirit, uh, John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit? Those are all possibilities. We'll talk a lot about John before we're all through. And, uh, but verily we are saying here, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth some other way, the same as the thief and the robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And to him the porter openeth, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And, uh, 
And he, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A recap. Verse 5, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And he's describing a characteristic of the sheep. But that's one of these things I don't think we can apply to the church. Because the tragedy, true is, the tragedy is, if you have false teachers, they do get a following, if people aren't careful. And that's, of course, a whole subject of a whole other study. But they say it's not possible to deceive the elect. And in that sense, you can apply that, because that is an a, a, a indication of Matthew 24, 24. If it were, very, he said, if it were possible, it, the Antichrist would deceive the very elect, but it won't be possible. So there is a f ultimate level of protection, if you will. But the... Um, they know his voice. All the Father giveth him shall come to me. And uh, that's, we've had that back in chapter 6. And that is going to be capped here in this chapter 10 in another way for a whole other subject. So I'll leave that a little bit later. But uh, they know his voice. So he's followed. Uh, and we find examples of that with Zacchaeus and where, he call, where he's called by name in uh, Luke 19. And Philip when he was seeking in, in the first chapter of John. And uh, we're going to encounter in the next chapter one of the most famous incidents where Lazarus responds to being called out of the grave. And we're always amused by that when we have Jesus call, Lazarus, come forth. And many people don't realize the reason he called him by name, otherwise they all would have, see? And he just wanted the one. But we'll get into that next time. But, uh, and then, of course, Mary recognized Jesus in the garden by his voice. She apparently thought he was the gardener. And as a whole study is, why is it that they didn't recognize him after the resurrection at first? Mary didn't. The guys on the Emmaus Road didn't that afternoon. And there's a whole study about that that we'll deal with before we're through with the study of John 2. That'll come up in later in John. So down to verse 6. We're making a good progress here. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So he, speak, he spoke parables. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. They weren't getting it, but he, he said it again. And uh, the word parable here is a mistranslation, by the way. Um, there are no parables in the Gospel of John. And uh, there are um, 27 of them in the Gospel of Luke. So we're so used to parables. But in this particular case, that the Greek term isn't really a parable. It's really a wayside saying or proverb in that sense. <clears throat> and so, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, small point, but because we'll talk a lot about parables elsewhere. But he says, I am the door of the sheep. So, we are dealing this with an identity. And uh, it's interesting to realize that um, the tabernacle was outside the camp. God is outside our organizations, is the underlying thought here. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That's Jesus. That's not my summary, that's Jesus' summary in verse 8. And uh, it's uh, some of the most severe denunciations in the scriptures are reserved for false teachers. The most vituperative language is done in that direction. And some of the most uh, earnest warnings we find in the New Testament deal with false teachers, false doctrines. And the language and the implications are... Uh, Obviously, uh, substantial. The word thief here, kleptus, implies stealth. The word robber, lestus, is, implies violence. Uh, it's incorrectly uh, translated as thief in a couple of places. And combined with kleptus, it means kill and destroy. So I don't think we have to get into the subtleties of the vocabulary. Let's move on. Verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. Not only be saved, but gain access, and also, in other words, that includes freedom. It's interesting that the freedoms that we inherit in the New Testament are a subject of a great theological debate. But the freedom in Christ is phenomenal. And uh, that's why uh, my wife has a great little plaque hanging in her ministry in Idaho. It says, uh, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. Now, Christians are the ones that organize their farming squads in circles, don't we? They have very self-destructive tendencies that we run into. 
It go, I mean, I am the door, he says. He says that twice here in, in, in verse 11 too. Um, and there's one door in the Ark of Noah and in the tabernacle, both. So that architecture is relevant. And shall be saved. And uh, be saved, safe and sound is what the term really means. And yet it also speaks of freedom. And uh, the, in, in Nehemiah 3, the sheep gate was the one that didn't have locks or, or, or uh, uh, bars on it. So it's a very useful idiom in that regard. But uh, we'll just keep moving here. Says, I am the door. If by me any man enter in and shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. By me, he says. Not just get in, but by me. And uh, so he's, he's, he's alluding here to a supernatural result. And of course, we know from many passages, and it's going to be hammered in John 15 when we get to it, is that without Christ, we can do nothing. And uh, it is given to him to believe on him. Philippians reminds us. But we only can believe only if the Father draw him, and we're going to engage that before this chapter is over also. And, uh, and you, also, you always have, the, I love the, re, the renderings. We see them in Sunday school so often, we take it for granted probably, but the idea of uh, showing the Savior with a lamb over shoulders, carrying him in his arms or whatever, you know. So, the, Christ is the only way to God. We don't have to hammer that here. I am the door. He says, by me, that, he's the, he has the power to impart. Uh, and if any man, that's Jew and Gentile, which is a shock to the Pharisees. They haven't gotten into that yet. And uh, so uh, and enter in as a simple act of faith. He shall be saved. And so, and he's going to be saved from three things. He's going to be saved uh, from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. And we'll explain that before the chapter is over also. And, uh, and go in and out. Going in and out, that freedom there is a freedom from bondage. And the most critical bondage is the bondage of sin. We'll talk about being delivered from the power of sin. He was, he was delivered, we were delivered from the penalty of sin by the cross. But there's more to it than that, and we'll deal with that before the day is over too. And so, uh, and find pasture. And of course, he's our sustainer. And uh, this actually echoes, what Jesus is saying here, echoes a prayer of Moses, I was intrigued to note. In Numbers 27, and Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, which may go in before them, which may lead them out, and in, which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Uh, I, I couldn't help but pick this up, because that idiom goes back to even Moses praying back there. So it's very timely to see it echoed here in the ministry of our king. But moving on to verse 10. The thief, now suddenly here, he, he, shifts, he shifts to singular. Those are, the thieves before was a plural all term, if you will. Here we've got a singular. To, the, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And so he's alluding here to a false shepherd. And specifically the personification of that being none other than Satan himself. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. There's more here than the English grammar tells you, by the way. Of course, I'm the good shepherd. That's fair enough. The word callous is good. Used 76 times. It, it turns out to be surprisingly consistent. In the Bible, the first mention of a word is usually among the most relevant. In fact, when you, when you discover something simple, it's very important in academia to give it a good fancy label. So they call this the principle of the first mention. Okay, so. But it's interesting, the word love, where does it first appear in the Bible? Okay. And it first appears, strangely enough, when Abram offers Isaac in Genesis 22. Many people don't realize that the word love first appears there. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, anyway, this is the first mention of the word good, because he's the good shepherd. And... Uh, if the first, oh, excuse me, the first mention was with wine in John chapter 2 for the wine at Cana, excuse me. And, uh, okay, um, and he's, he's uh, obviously Israel's shepherd and so forth. We are the sheep of his pasture and so on. But there's another thing here. He giveth his life for the sheep. The word for, F-O-R, in your English doesn't catch the meaning in, that is of the word in the Greek. The word in the Greek, he gave his life for the sheep. He gave his life in the place of the sheep. It's a substitutionary concept 
which is missed in the English. When I just say for, the preposition do, in the English doesn't really capture all that. The Greek does, okay, for what it's worth. And uh, he lays down his life. We see that in four verses. Not as a martyr for truth or a moral example. No, 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 no. There have been many martyrs for truth or people who have died as an example to others. No, no. He desired for those people to be effective. It had effect for them, is the point. It's a different concept here. He lays down his life, not for people in general, for his sheep specifically, not the goats. And you could dig that out from the Scripture. And uh, you Calvinists will have a field day with that, but we'll go on here. Okay. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. And so that's the difference. That's, that fact, that's probably the primary difference. And uh, so, so these are the hirelings, the term you hear is the unfaithful shepherds, the mercenaries, if you will. There's a, there's a, there, there, well, we could go on about that. They scattereth, not devoureth. No sheep of Christ can ever perish. We're going to get into that too before through. A guy is not a horse thief because he steals a horse. He steals a horse because he's a horse thief. That's the concept here. There's a, a fundamental that's being revealed. It's not a... Okay, so... The, uh, he must be a Christian before he can really live a Christian life. And you're not a Christian because you lead a Christian life. We do not become sheep by following the shepherd. It's the opposite, if you will. Okay. And of course, character is always revealed by crisis, as any sailor knows. A sailor's character is found, you find it in a storm, not in a sunny day. And uh, it was very interesting in World War II that the United States Navy, before World War II, had a habit when the weather was good, they, they would uh, go out on maneuvers. If it was rain, they'd cancel. The Japanese did just the opposite. When it was good weather, they gave their guys R&R. When there was a storm, they went to sea. And we didn't really learn that until later in the war. And we got to the point, we could, if we knew the weather patterns, we didn't have satellites then, but we knew where the, we could find the Japanese fleet. Because they made weather and storms their ally. And uh, it was interesting to discover, and, and, and uh, uh, that's one thing at the Naval Academy we took advantage of, as we stand in naval history. It's interesting. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, the storm reveals the sailor. And that's exactly what Paul deals with when he gives the final briefing to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, a very key passage you might want to study. And so, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and, uh, and am known of mine. Know my sheep. And that one of the heaviest passages in the Gospels is Matthew 7, verse 22 and 23, where come people think they're saved and Jesus says, I never knew you. And um, heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. And it's interesting also to notice when it says, I'm a good shepherd and know my sheep. The types here are relevant. Whether you're talking about Joseph, Moses, David, they all tended their father's sheep. And Jesus is going to put himself in that mode before this chapter is over. That the sheep that he's attending are the ones given to him by the Father. And that's a dimension he's going to trade on very heavily before we're through. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And again, we have that same word uh, for, not merely on behalf of, but in the stead of. There's a difference, a special use there in the Greek. Hooper. Now, as we talk the, uh, on these topics, one of the things you need to be aware of, and most of your study Bibles will have a footnote of this, of this type somewhere, that they uh, will uh, acquaint you with the shepherd psalms. There's three of them, well known for that purpose. Psalm 22 talks about the suffering Savior, and it's so precise. Now understand it was written 700 years before crucifixion was invented. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, widely adopted by the Romans, but a relatively recent mechanism. But this describes the crucifixion of Christ in such detail that there are articles in the American Medical Journal, journal that highlight the cause of death from the details in Psalm 22, and uh, for what it's worth. And so it's uh, it uh, now so uh, so it's it, some people uh, it, this relates to the Good Shepherd of the first 18 verses of chapter 10. That's why it's here in this study. 
the living shepherd is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. People who have never heard anything in the Bible, they all know the 23rd Psalm, right? And uh, so, and uh, Chuck Smith always, there's some incident in his life where he uh, left two little puppies on his front, tied to his front door. And they had names on them. Uh, uh, goodness and mercy. And of course, it's an echo of the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Somebody pulled that prank on him many years ago. The Great Shepherd uh, is, of course, Hebrews 13. And then you get to the third of these three Psalms. We have Psalm 22, 23. Psalm 24 is the exalted sovereign. These Psalms are quite different in their style, quite different in their focus. But they're also the, 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 the Good Shepherd is characterized by Psalm 22. The Great Shepherd Hebrews uh, is uh, Psalm 23. And the Exalted Sovereign Psalm 24, the chief shepherd. And so, if you can, some people associate symbols with these. They feel that Psalm 22 symbol would be the cross, the Savior's cross. Psalm 23, that would be Psalm 22. Psalm 23 would be the shepherd's crook. And the, the Psalm 24 would be the, the king's crown. So you have the Savior's cross, the shepherd's crook, and the king's crown as idiomatic, if you will, of those three psalms. And I encourage you to study those three psalms in light of the the study tonight. Then Jesus goes on. He says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they, 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 there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And that's, a, that's something that was predicted in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, that the Gentiles also would become heirs to the kingdom. And that not, not a popular topic with the Pharisees, but one that Jesus did clearly endorse here. Other sheep, not of this fold. And uh, I must bring. And uh, I have. You see, he has these. I not will have, shall have. He has them now. Because they're his now, whether they know it or not. And uh, there's no uncertainty, no contingency here. And we we'll go on here. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Wow! Here is an encapsulation of exactly what's coming. It wasn't a, a surprise. It was planned for before the, wor before the world was created. Ephesians 1.4 When did Jesus first start thinking of you? Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.4 That whole brief lesson. Anyway, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Wow. You see? I lay, it, it was, he, it, he it voluntarily endured by his own power. I laid it down himself. The very ones that were sent to Gethsemane to arrest him were the ones that were laying prostrate on the ground. And remember when he gets to Pilate later that day. Thou couldst have no power at all against me unless it was given to thee above. He, those are his declarations. Those aren't empty brags. And what held him to the cross? It wasn't the nails. He was crucified on a cross of wood. Yet he made the hill on which it stood. At any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. No, what held him to that cross was not the nails. It was love for you and me. Impossible to imagine. Incomparable. He gave up the ghost. When he died, he was the one that gave up his life. It wasn't the Romans. He did. And John 19, is, we're going to talk about that when we get to John 19 in a great deal. John is going to spend virtually half of his entire gospel on that last week. In fact, for the last, for one 24-hour period, he focuses on but it's something I might mention about the resurrection. You can, the statements I'm going to make here are true of every major event in the creation of the world. The, 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 uh, every, every major milestone can be attributed to the Son in the resurrection, of course, in John 2.19. By the Father, we see that in Romans 6.4, or to the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Godhead have specific attributions of the Incarnation, of the resurrection, of the ascension, and so on. So, well, there was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these. Now, here again, I want you to notice something. 
The word Jews, when John uses it, refers to the leadership. We use the term as an, a catch-all collective. That's fine. But John really, we discover by the way he uses it, is referring to the leadership of the Jews. That's going to be important. Because there's been tragedies imposed on the Jews by a misunderstanding of that by the early church. But moving on here. There was a division again, therefore, among, them, uh, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? It's going to be a very strange time coming. You've got be- people born blind walking around. You're going to have men that died that came to life. Interesting times that we're going to move into here. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. This is one of these little verses that's got nothing to do, apparently, of the, what's going on here. And I'm always amused by that, because when you go to seminary, they hammer and hammer that everything takes its meaning by context. You've got to always put it in the context. And of course, Matthew shreds that, because almost every allusion he makes in prophecy is not in context, and that's the way we learn a lot about it. Here's a verse, to the best of my awareness, has nothing really to do with the situation at hand. So most of you, when you're reading a Bible, you come across something like this, you just keep reading and going on. But if you've been to a Chuck Missler Bible study, you, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted person anymore, because you'll remember that that nut said every detail is there deliberately. Every number, every place name in the text, even irregularities in the grammar in the text are deliberate, really. Well, it was Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, no problem there. Why does the Holy Spirit tell you it was winter? Well, let me tell you right up front, when you come across something like this, you'll discover that God always rewards the diligent. Whatever it might be, it might be very unrelated to what you're reading, but there's a treasure there if you take the trouble to track it down. Well, it was the Feast of Dedication. Dedication of what? Well, the temple, presumably. Okay, Feast of Dedication. And it, what else would you dedicate? Right? Temple, yeah, okay. Now, it was winter. Well, the first thing you got to do is understand a little bit about history to understand it never was dedicated in the winter. Really? Yeah, Feast of Dedication, it was winter. Solomon's Temple was the first one, right? It was dedicated in 1 Kings 8 at harvest time, before the winter. Okay? All right. Well, maybe, how about the other one? You get to Nehemiah's temple, 70 years later, or whatever, right? In uh, Ezra 6, 15, you discover it was dedicated in the spring. So now you've got a problem. There's an error in the scripture. There's only two t- temples, one in the spring, and one in, the, in, in uh, uh, one at harvest time, or in the autumn, right? This one was, he's making an allusion here that there's a dedication in the winter. Well, it turns out that if you do a little bit of homework, you discover that uh, there was an incident occurred when, under the Greeks, under the Seleucid Empire, a uh, a egomaniac by the name of Antiochus IV, Antiochus the Great was Antiochus III, but the one we're interested in is his successor, Antiochus IV, who decided he was going to act like God. And he tried to uh, get, uh, get rid of, to force Greek culture on them and to get rid of Judaism. And among other things, he had them slaughter pigs on their altars. You can imagine uh, to an Orthodox Jew how that went over, right? And he did a number, of, and, and on his birthday, he decided to go do even more to erect an idol to, the, in, to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. That did it. Judas Maccabus had five sons, and uh, when the guy came to their village to enforce this thing, they slaughtered him, and the gang went into the hills as guerrilla fighters, got organized, and one of the sons had a nickname, the Hammer. You can imagine what kind of guy was. And so there, that was known as the Maccabees, the Hammers. Uh, it was actually the Hasmonean was the family. But the point is, they actually successfully throw off the yoke of the Greek Empire. It took him three years to achieve that. And uh, on the anniversary of Antiochus' birthday, when he triggered all this back in 167 B.C. and 164 B.C., they they, uh, um, uh, celebrate that. 
by taking all the things that were desecrated by them and destroying them, making new ones, and rededicating the temple at that time, which was winter. It happened to be uh, on, uh, uh, on Antiochus' birthday, and that now is still celebrated in the Jewish community by Hanukkah. Now, most of you know have Jewish friends. You know that around our Christmas time, they, they uh, celebrate their own holiday. And it's it, like every holiday, it gets surrounded by other colorful legends. But the real issue of Hanukkah is celebrate the rededication of the temple when they regained the ability to do so. And uh, that ushers in the, the, their, their, a period of rulership called the Hasmoneans. And what's interesting, though, this is here because the Holy Spirit wanted us to understand that even though Hanukkah is not one of the feasts of Moses, it's not in the Torah, they celebrate it. There's, there's two, two uh, holidays they separate that are not in the Torah. One is Hanukkah and the other one is Purim from, from uh, you know, the days of Esther and all that. So why does the Holy Spirit want us to understand Hanukkah? Because you won't understand a remark by the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave his disciples about his second coming unless you have that background. Because four disciples are going to come to Jesus at night and, and uh, uh, he's going to, they ask him about, about his second coming and he gives him what we call the Olivet Discord that night. And the key event in that is the abomination of desolation when you see the, that standing in the holy place. Well, you, what is that? We wouldn't know really the technicalities if we didn't understand that it happened once before. And Jesus is talking about something that's yet going to happen again. He's using a historical idiom for something yet future. And we understand what it is by really understanding what Antiochus Epiphanes did that led to Hanukkah in the first place. So this is, like a, this is in effect like a flagpole saying, do your historical homework or you won't understand the idioms that Jesus is going to use when he gets to the Olivet Discourse. So that's all hung up on John 10.22, which is basically calling our attention to the worship of Hanukkah. And so, and so the... Yeah, so the harvest is passed, we're in, so we're not saved. The door's closed. Oh, so we move on here. So dedication of another temple, we've gone into that. Okay, verse 23, we're making progress here. Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's, uh, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And uh, you understand, when you say the Christ, that's the Greek term for what in Hebrew would be the Mashiach, the Messiah. And uh, I love the International Standard Version Bible because the word Christ does not appear in the New Testament. They use the word Messiah. And same word, really, but it reminds us of the Jewish roots of it, you see. And, and of course, this is outside the sacred enclosures in Solomon's porch and so forth. And their house is left to them desolate, and uh, that, that's going to yet transpire when we're here. That's yet future. And uh, they say, thou makest to doubt. That's just like Adam blaming God for Eve's deception. That woman you gave me did all this. Same thing. They're trying to say their disbelief is Christ's fault. That's sort of the flavor of the thing here. In John's Gospel, Jesus' messiahship is declared to the disciples in chapter 1. We've seen that before. To the Samaritans in chapter 4. To the blind beggar in the last chapter. And uh, it's not given to the multitudes. And in fact, he gives, uh, uh, Matthew points that out. That from Matthew 12 on, he never speaks in public without parables. Why? So that they wouldn't understand. Why did, God, why did Jesus use parables? Well, to make things clearer. No, the opposite. That sounds crazy until you read carefully Matthew 13. No, not to multitudes, religious leaders. It was impossible to, to lawfully seize him before God's appointed time. Also enforce responsibility. He's forcing the responsibility to the nation at large here. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The words that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So the Son of Man had authority over judgment in chapter 5. He's the one of whom Moses spoke. That was from chapter 5, verse 46. He's the living bread in chapter 6. Abraham rejoiced to see me in chapter 8. These are all statements he's made already. So he's not going to repeat those here. He just leans on the works give testimony. And that's what he's saying here, the works that I do in my Father's name. Okay. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. 
unbelief because you are not of my sheep. That order is important. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Wow, that's quite a statement. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Wow. My sheep hear my voice, starts this passage. That, we're going to see that in the next chapter. That's going to act, his voice is actually going to call one of the sheep back from the dead. Lazarus is chapter 11 of, of, of John. But, uh, and, I, I, and I shall give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The life that Jesus give, offers us is not probationary. If you have it, it's without withdrawal. It's forever. And uh, now, there are many, many passages that deal with this whole dilemma of eternal security. And uh, we could spend easily several hours on that topic alone. But of all of the passages, this happens to be my favorite on that subject. Because here in verse 28, he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Where are you right now? You are effectively in the palm of his hand. It gets better than that. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're seeing here a fist made of two hands. His hand, his, his hand and the Father's hand. I'm in there. I don't believe I could get out of there if I tried. I really mean that. I'm not being cute or flippant here. I mean it quite sincerely. I'm using their idiom. And this is the eternal fist of the Father and the Son. I cannot imagine a more inviolable, uh, unviolatable uh, idiom that you can imagine. I can't imagine anything more sure than that in my own thing. Anyway, we're Christ's sheep. It's the duty of the shepherd to care for each of his flock, not the sheep's. It's the shepherd's responsibility, not the sheep's. Okay? They follow. Not ought to follow. They follow. Each imparted with eternal life. Ending or forfeiture is a contradiction in terms. Given, not merited. Is given, not merited. And if you didn't merit it, you can't demerit it. Shall never perish. And I don't believe God can lie. There are a couple of things God can't do. Did you know that? He can't lie. It's contrary to his nature. Something else he can't do, he can't learn. Which means he can't be disappointed in you. Your biggest disappointment is something that doesn't surprise him. He loves you anyway. That's what's amazing. That's the problem with the biggest, most amazing part of it all. And unable to pluck them. The devil is unable to destroy a single one of them. Satan can't get you out of that eternal fist. Praise God for that. If there was a way to mess it up, I would. I know enough about myself. There are very few mistakes I've missed. I think I've done them all. So praise God, my eternal destiny with Him doesn't rest on that because He's done it all and it was all completed 2,000 years ago on a wooden cross erected in Judea. There's some other things that need development, but my justification is nailed to that cross. Okay. Now, if our salvation hangs on anything other than the completed work of Christ, we're in trouble. If our salvation hangs on anything else other than the completed work of Jesus Christ, we're in trouble. That would lead to some theoretical undoing. If our salvation is not secure, how can Jesus say of the ones to whom he gives eternal life, they shall never perish? That implies, I shouldn't say implies, that expresses secu uh, security. If Christ came to seek and save that which was lost, and yet if someone, somehow we can become unsaved, and thereby undo what Jesus has done, 
Wouldn't it be unduly risky to keep us on the earth after we've been saved? No, see, that's, that's essential for everything that's going on here. Not our benefit, everything he's doing. He's not building on quicksand here. And if, so, if that could be possible, how could we be anxious for nothing, as Paul teaches us? So, anyone who has questions about salvation does not really understand what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago. That's my premise. That's my premise. What separates those who will spend eternity in heaven and those who will spend it in hell? Not the absence of sin, but the acceptance of a gift. Once and for all. The question I'll leave with you, is there anything keeping you from accepting that free gift right now? If you haven't accepted it, in the privacy of your own will, when we pray, you can nail that for eternity before we leave. Romans chapter 3, let's just take a quick glimpse here so we can get the theology out of the way. To, to declare, I say that this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works. Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude, key point, the most, the most challenging intellectual document in, that's ever been penned is the book of Romans. I challenge you to find anything that's deeper, more comprehensive, more complete than that incredible document. But the, one of the key conclusions is right here in verse 28 of chapter 3. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And it's amazing how many, many very serious theologians can't, get their, can't understand that. It's a, it's a very fundamental thing. Therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I want to get it at this a little bit better. Uh, Donald, uh, uh, Dr. Earl Rademacher likes to come into the classroom. Um, he's an interesting guy, fun guy. But he loves to come into a discussion. He says, I've been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And he likes to say that because it stirs up, you know, dissension among the students. I've been saved, I'm being saved, I'm going to be saved. And he does that deliberately to make a point that he's after here. And it's, one of the things I'm going to point out is the term salvation is misused so many ways. Sometimes a word is used so commonly it loses its precision. And so it becomes a clumsy term to go in the electronic, in the technology world, the word system is used so widely it has come, it's become almost meaningless. And the word salvation is similar to that. It's a, it's a, I was saved from a burning building last week. Well, that's not what we're talking about. I'm just using it as a rhetorical device. Okay. The past tense, if you treat it as if it's a verb, the past tense of salvation we call justification. What does that really mean? It's the gift of God of everlasting life received by faith alone in Christ. That's what justification essentially means. And there's plenty of places it's used. That's the past tense. The present tense of salvation we call sanctification. And what is that? It's a work in progress that involves the faith and the works of the uh, believer. I want you to notice the, the justification does not derive from sanctification. Okay. And the future tense of salvation we'll call glorification. And that's the result of the previous two aspects. But the two aspects, the first one is past tense, justification, done deal, period, done. Sanctification is a work in progress. Every one of us in this room, me included, are a work in progress, hopefully, advancing. Okay. All believers will be glorified, resurrected and given a body like Christ. Some will have more glory than others, we discover, with the, what we call rewards. Let's look at this another way. The past tense of salvation, is separation from the penalty of sin. Your passport to heaven is stamped that you are not guilty. And you can, you didn't earn that. It was a gift. But you got stamped. You're separated from the penalty of sin. That will never again be an issue before the bar. We call that justification. 
The present tense is separation from the power of sin. If you are an unbeliever, you are in bondage to sin. You have no choice. You can't get over it. If you're in Christ, you have the power to be separated. You have the power to be separated from the power of sin because you can call upon the Holy Spirit. So you have a supernatural access that the non believer doesn't have. We call that sanctification. That's a work in progress. The future tense, of course, is separation from the very presence of sin. When we're glorified, the fantastic thing when we're at the throne of God is that sin won't even be present in any way. That's why there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Not only is the creation redeemed, so is heaven cleaned up because it has, there's some unsavory characters that have access to it. So, the point is justification, sanctification, glorification are the past tense, present tense, future tense of what we call uh, salvation. So the word salvation is an awkward phrase because it doesn't... That's why there's so many arguments about salvation because which aspect are you talking about? And uh, there's different facets to it. And there's, it's, like three, it's like a verbal, uh, a verbal paradigm. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares us righteous. We're not, but we're declared such. Justification makes us righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Just sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. So they're very distinctively different. So, question to ask on the, uh, beyond your final exam. Can a man lose his salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. If it depends on you. If my salvation depended on me, I am in trouble. I'm glad it doesn't. I know in whom I believe that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And I could go on and on with those things. Now there's two groups of people that have been warring over this issue for 400 years. One group of the Aminians, as they're known, denies that the true child of God is eternally secure. They're, they're uncomfortable with that point of view. The Calvinist insists that if he does not persevere in holiness, he was never regenerate in the first place. That turns out not to be very helpful. You talk about predestination. Well, how do you tell if you've been predestinated? Well, you get to the end of the road. If you've arrived there, you are predestinated. That's not very useful until you get to the end of the road. That's why the theologian would call that experiential predestination. After 400 years of doctrinal divisions, there are good scholars on both sides of this issue. It appears to be the result of the failure to adequately distinguish between justification and the possibility of several different inheritances. See, there's a difference between entering heaven and inheriting. When we were in Auckland here recently for those conferences on Israel and so forth, we signed into a hotel, we signed the register, and we were given entry that doesn't give us the, the, the privilege of moving the furniture or redecorating. No, no, we just it, it, there's a difference between inheriting. We didn't inherit that hotel. We, we were given access for a while. And I'm not implying that our access to heaven is conditional, but entry isn't the same thing as inheriting. That's the point. Can you lo- uh, inheritances include things that can be lost. Ask Reuben about that. Ask Esau about that. The prodigal son in the New Testament never lost his sonship, but he sure blew his inheritance. And we can too. We run the risk of blowing our head. That's why, that's why Paul is just a type A. Terrified. Lest I preach to others, I myself might be disqualified. Be a castaway is your English. More precise, be disqualified. Is he afraid of losing something? Absolutely not. He wrote the book on eternal security. It's called Romans chapter 8. No, what he's afraid of is losing his inheritance by, by underperforming. See, the Calvinists have their particular series of views, and the Armenians have a different point of view. They're both wrong in what they aver, and they're both, I mean, they're both right in what they aver, they're both wrong in what they deny. What they've overlooked is, of course, there is a third view between those two. If you nail down the eternal security issue and realize that's ta- you're talking about justification, and then recognize the biblical distinction between an entering and inheriting. You discover the whole epistle of the book of Hebrews talks about the fact that at Kadesh Barnea they did not inherit. 
They lacked the faith to go in, and God forgave them for that. But they still didn't inherit. And, and that, that distinction is what uh, really is, underlies the whole the epistle of Hebrews, among a lot of other passages too. So that's really what we're suggesting here, is a middle ground that's between those two extremes. In the epistle of Hebrews, Paul says, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Whoa! Partakers. The word is metakoi. We're, we're metakoi. One who shares in as a partner, comrade, and so forth, in an office, worker, dignity. A partaker. And we're, part, we're metakoi if, uh oh, there's a condition. Condition. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See, there is a condition. That is to hang in there and be faithful. Your salvation doesn't depend on it, but your inheritance does. And uh, so, the partaker, is a, as a true child of God, is obligated to perse- uh, persevere. That's what Paul's word in Romans, in fact, of all places, Romans 8. But he might not. And if he does not, he does not forfeit salvation. But faces divine discipline in time, the loss of reward of the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10. All three persons of the Godhead have a share in preserving to fruition that which God has determined. So our basis of our eternal security depends upon God the Father, it depends on God the Son, and it depends on God the Holy Spirit. And we spend a full hour on each of those in another study, and I'm not going to take you through all that, I'll give you a few highlights to give you the flavor of it. Our security depends on all three. Our security depends on God the Father. Let's take a look at that for a minute. How is it dependent upon, upon his sovereign purpose? Because he declares that purpose in Ephesians 1. It's anchored within the veil, confirmed by an oath in Hebrews 6. Um, it's also dependent upon his solemn promise, on, on his faithfulness, not ours. I'm so grateful for that. And uh, so it's, a, it, it's a, a faith, nothing on man's part. It might be by grace because it's all on God's part. To the end that the promise might be secure, Paul points out in Romans 4. And so, okay. If it depended at any point upon human ability to continue to believe, then the promise could not be secure. The promise that those who believe will be saved is confirmed elsewhere, and we go through all those if you like. It depends upon God's infinite power. He is now free to save us because the, the penalty has been paid by His Son. Christ's death has rendered God free to save us in spite of our moral imperfection. See, uh, if it hadn't been paid for, he would be violating his justice. Our eternal security does not depend on our moral worthiness, and God is a propitiation for our sins, and we go on and on about that. And uh, to assume that there is some sin sufficiently serious which causes us to forfeit our salvation is to assume that we were less worthy of salvation after committing this than before. No, it's our worthiness is not the issue. Christ's worthiness is the whole story. And so, anyway, that's a, let's move on here. He has purpose to keep us saved. So that's the Father. We go through, we, that's a whole study. You can spend an hour on that one. It depends on the Son. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. There's several dozen scriptures that nail this one. But the reason I'm not going to bother here, not only because we don't have time, is <clears throat> when we get to John 17, Jesus is going to take his responsibility and give it to the Father. So he's going to stand in his stead in that regard. But there is a third one, the Holy Spirit. And there's much there, but let's just pick one issue, and that's the sealing power of the Holy Spirit. He has, he, of course, he has the power of regeneration we, that when we're born again. His baptizing ministry is part of all of that. And then he also has his sealing ministry. Let's just pick this one thing to, to, to nail our head on here. Jesus' tomb was sealed. That meant it, you couldn't get into it. it was there. The, word, the concept of sealing. Satan is sealed in the abyss for a thousand years. That sealing means it isn't breakable. That's what the word means. And uh, several books have been sealed, we understand, and so forth. 144,000 are sealed in Revelation 7 and so on. And uh, so the Holy Spirit has a sealing ministry. If one person who is born <coughs> again in Christ is ever fails to enter into heaven when he dies then God will have broken his pledge. No conditions are mentioned. It is a work of God and depends upon him alone. And so, uh, I love 2 Corinthians 1. 
who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The word sealed us is pretty straightforward. That's a Greek term that means protection and ownership, like the seal on the same words used on the tomb of Christ and so forth. And uh, the earnest is like a pledge, like a down payment, Arabon. And uh, so it's uh, the first installment, if you will, which secures the deal, is the point. It's proof that the thing is, is committed to. It's a deposit, it's a pledge, and so forth. Evidence, it's more than just evidence of good faith, but it ob- uh, the obligating party to consume specific performance, as we would call it. And uh, so, anyway, moving on here. And Ephesians 1, In whom we trusted after that he had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we were sealed. So I'll re- and, and same idea. So let's just wrap this issue up, if I may. Um, I want to take you through a few verses in, uh, I'm going to ask seven questions in Romans 8, starting at verse 31. Seven questions. Can opposition defeat the Christian? Is that possible? Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the first kind of condition. It's just, it means since. Since God is for us and so forth. And... Uh, uh, God is the self-existent, sovereign creator. Since he is for believers, no one can oppose believers successfully. Second question, will we have the resources? You ever worry, ever worry about that? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us those things? That famous verse has a word missing that wasn't translated. Both the King James and the Real Isaac failed to translate the Greek gay, which means even. He that even spared not his own son. Okay, so it's even more emphatic, if I may, and so on. So, and uh, Abraham never withheld his son, and you can go on and build on that one. Will our failures reverse our justification, is the question at, at the bar here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. In other words, the fix is in. The judge is the guy that's signed the papers for us. And uh, so we can go through all of that. Can anyone condemn us for any reason? He answers, well, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh the intercession for us. The son of the judge is our defense counsel. The fix is in, gang. God is, Jesus is God's appointed judge in the first place. And uh, he's the one that we've trusted for our salvation and so forth. And uh, we can, th- this is all about it. We'll move on here a little bit. Having justified the ungodly, of course, God will not, will not and cannot contradict himself by charging them with evil. Who is he that condemneth, he asks. Paul gives us four answers, each of which are taught elsewhere in the Scripture. But they're gathered here to underscore the unconditional security of the believer. Christ died, that he has risen, that he advocates and that he intercedes. There's a fourfold answer to this issue right here in this verse. God has already justified the man who believes in Jesus. How can he lay anything to the charge of his already justified one? His justification, justification comes from imputed righteousness of Christ and is legally ours. It's not a subject of merit, therefore it cannot be lost by demerit. And so, like a father, God can doesn't, a can and does correct his earthly sons. But they always remain sons. Prodigal son being the exemplar of that. Well, they'll ask another question, what kind of assurance can we have of victory? They want you to leave this room without having this final verse. It's kind of great. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Quite a list, by the way. There are seven setbacks that the apostle puts in here, and he experienced them all. And I won't go through the tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, naked, peril, or sword. That's comprehensive, and Paul had experienced every one of those. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In all these adversities, 
More than. You might want to make a list sometime. Find all the more thans in the scripture. And we don't have to keep hammering this. Let's just, go, let's just wrap it up and get going here. What's his final guarantee? The last verse of this tour de force. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Period. Defense rests. Okay. Final guarantee. Angels, principalities, those are all demons. No. Powerless. Powers of darkness. What else is there? They can't touch us. This verse should reprioritize everything in our lives. Our outlook on everything should be impacted by this. Well, let's continue to wrap up the chapter here. I and my, Jesus continues the discussion that we departed from. I and my Father are one, is the way it's in your, in, in, uh, your text, but it's wrong. He actually says, I and the Father. It's an absolute term, if you will. And no created power is able to resist him. Then the Jews took up stones again to destroy him. Whenever we might miss the point, the Pharisees come to our rescue to underscore for this. And uh, Jesus said, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Jesus answers them, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, because thou being a man, makest thyself God. See, the enmity's always been there. At infancy in Matthew 2, as a youth in Nazareth, and Psalm 88 highlights it, in the, in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4, uh, at the cross, there's always been the enmity. It's astonishing that God himself, the creator himself, enters his creation to fulfill a destiny for us we can't for us, and he meets en- enmity. Now he gives them a quote that has been widely misunderstood by many. But when Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he, call, if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, then the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. In other words, the fact, he's, he's showing an, an exception grammatically in their own scriptures that really uh, uh, has been widely misunderstood. And so, the... Uh, the scripture cannot be broken. They say broken is the same word used as to annul a marriage, if you will. And uh, this is an authentication, by the way, of the entire Old Testament, in effect. But uh, ye are gods is the term that's troublesome here. And that's from Psalm 82, verse 6. And it was used there in the sense of people who are acting as magistrates. And, and, it's be, and it, that's a misapplication, in, in, in effect. Uh, that because they judged for God in the room of God, whose sentences were God's sentences, whose judgment was God's judgment, rebels against whom were rebels against God. And so, if the magistrates are called God's sons, may not the Messiah claim the same title as this point? So, but let's move on. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not in me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So that's the second part of his reply, the works of power. Therefore they sought him again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. They can't touch him. And he went away again beyond the Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. You may recall that's where he's baptized, at Bethabara, if you will. And so, the house of passage. So his public ministry is now over, and he's up presently outside the camp. And that wraps it up here. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all these things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. So that wraps up the chapter. And we ran a little bit over time. But let's, uh, uh, like you, for next session, prepare by reading about two Lazaruses. Chapter 11 is the famous raising of Lazarus. And in and of itself is a great study. And it's, it's, it's great fun for a lot of reasons. But as long as we're bringing up Lazarus there, there's a different guy unrelated to him that also happens to have the name Lazarus for some reasons. And so you might want to just refresh your memory on Luke 16, the last half of that chapter, as preparation for our next session. And with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer.